Uh, welcome everyone. Welcome to the second edition of Soft UK's webinar series. Um, this one's going to be all about the importance of support. Um, we'll we'll jump right in and do um, some introductions, and then we'll crack on with the the discussion um, straight after. So I'm Sonia. I'm the communications officer for Soft UK. Um, I've been with them for over seven years now. Um, I'm also a bereaved parent to a beautiful boy who had trisomy 13. So I'm more than happy to share my experience from a bereaved family perspective um, for this, for the purpose of the discussion. Um, Barbara, can I ask you to introduce yourself? Um, my name is, is Barbara Rosenthal. Um, I, I first made contact with, well, it was, it was Jenny that made contact with me. It was about 11 years ago, I think to do some training um, for SOFT uh, on behalf of Cruise Bereavement Support. And uh, and so I've retained a link ever since. So, yeah, thank Which you. We have. <laughs> Debbie? Hi, I'm Debbie. I'm grandma to Joshua, who's five years old. Uh, Josh has got partial trisomy 18 but so much of the chromosome is duplicated. He might as, um, they've, they've said he, he might as well be full trisomy 18. He needs all care. Uh, he's the most adorable, happy little boy. Um, and he was diagnosed uh, postnatally, not postnatally, uh, not prenatally. Um, I'm also a, a, a newly appointed trustee for SOF, so that's my association. Um, so my experience really is around being a grandma, um, supporting my son and daughter-in-law um, through having Joshua. So I can talk about my experience as far as support goes and what I was able to offer to them. Yeah, brilliant. And Jemima? Yeah, um, I am mother to Callie, who is nearly nine and has full trisomy 18. <clears throat> Um, I my involvement with Soft is that I've been writing uh, articles and blogs about living with a surviving um, child with trisomy eighteen, um, and the support that I've received as a parent, and also the support that I've wanted and maybe not received as a parent, has made me really passionate about this subject, and so much so that my my job now is a disabled persons navigator so I help disabled people and also their carers to navigate the systems of support that's out there and help them access better support and feel a bit more in control of their lives. Oh yeah I definitely I bet, I bet they appreciate that it's such a nice niche area for you to it per be perfect for as well so yeah <laughs> I love my work yeah yeah so let's kick off with the first um, discussion point what sort of support system do um would you describe families have around them when making I, I'm saying decisions, but I'd also like to say choices, um, which I think is slightly different but just as equally important to to bring up. What what support system do you think families have or go through when being sort of put in front of this um sort of scenario experience for themselves? Um, so I, I think that building up a support network is part of the work of mm -hmm. finding yourself on this journey, wherever your journey starts and ends, and that's very different for different parents. Um, so for a parent like myself, I feel like a lot of my work has been building up the right kind of support, um, creating the right kind of relationships with professionals and with figuring out which friends um are able to support me which sadly isn't everyone um and it's not always their fault <laughs> but you mm. know when you when you when you find yourself in a situation which is very unique it can feel quite lonely and it can take time to figure out who's going to be there for you um so I always feel for people that are very new to this that actually they may not even know what their support network is or what mm. good support feels like to begin with. We, when we were starting out, we thought we were getting good support when we were we were kind of convinced to 
sign a do not resuscitate um, plan for, for, for Callie, which actually wasn't wasn't good advice and mm. was well-meaning, but not good support. And, and now eight years later, we, we feel like we're much more in an informed place to know know what good support feels like, if that makes sense. Yeah, what we are following on from that, what what would you how how would you describe good support to to look like or feel like or would you say it comes over time once you you know you've been through a bit of it yourself? Uh, well, I mean, oh, sorry. I, I I was I was gonna um support what Jemima was saying. I think when you first get the diagnosis. I don't think you even know what support looks like because you're dealing so much with the diagnosis and you get into doing yeah. There's all the practical things, you know, of un understanding what the diagnosis means. You know, if the, the, you know, the baby's poorly, it's dealing with, you know, all those issues around, will my, you know, child survive or, or not. And I think, Support comes maybe in the beginning, practically, you know, so practical things to help, you know, do the night shifts in the hospital or prepare meals. Yes. And then, but then the mental support, the psychological support, I'm not even sure, you know, that, that you realise that till a bit later on. Certainly that would be our experience because especially, you know, with the diagnosis of trisomy and the, you know, maybe life expectancy, you know, being very short, you, you've got so much to deal with at that time. And then, so I think support changes as time goes on. Mm -hmm. um and and I mean I, I can remember you know when when we got the diagnosis for Josh he was about eight weeks old and I can remember us sitting New Year's Eve you know we got the diagnosis and and you know just saying what how can I best support you because you just don't you know you just don't know but not everybody would feel able to ask that yeah or know what that looks like or you know, Jemima, you mentioned about not getting the support that you might have got, because I think people who you might think support, you don't know how, how to do it. So it's there's no rule, is there? I think it's something that you feel your way through. I would say, though, actually, that <clears throat> all uh, you're, you're completely right, but there are also some things for me which I think uh, actually feel... <clears throat> like good support no matter who it is or where you are in your journey and that so from a professional perspective good support for me feels like when the professional wants to work collaboratively with you when they want to listen to you when mm. you feel like they've got enough time for you when they take the time to learn your name and you're not just mum or dad yeah or grandma <laughs> you know mm. um when you feel like they see you for the person that you are all of this kind of all of this kind of empathy and time and seeing you as a holistic unit as a family, not just as a pregnant belly or a mm -hmm. a diagnosis or all, all of that stuff, no matter where you are in your journey, that stuff often feels really nurturing um and that can come from any professional. I remember um just after Callie was born and everyone was telling us not to expect very much we went to see the GP and he was the first person it was like well she might surprise you and then he gave us his personal mobile number and he was like just call me if you need anything and, you know and that was do you know what I mean? that for, for us that was mm. like it was like a ray of light it was like it was like the first brick of, yeah. of of what has become a really good support network mm -hmm. you know the first person that was prepared to go that extra mile and you know, in those early weeks, we rang him for some really ridiculous things because we were new parents as well. And we we didn't know whether she, what she was doing was dying or teething. You know, <laughs> it was like, mm. you know it's kind of um, those professionals are just worth their weight in gold, I think. And then when you start thinking about friends, you know, it's those friends and those family members that can actually just sit there with your despair can don't just try and bright side you or you know at least this or 
well, you know, you know, those people, they're not always trying to come up with solutions. Mm -hmm. You know, they're the they're the ones that you know that can just be be with the kind of full the the full depth and trauma of, of the diagnosis, <laughs> you know. Um and did you help them with those conversations, Jemima? Or was that something they just did naturally? What do you mean? Did I help? You know, so so the the people who you most appreciated the support from, the ones who sat with you, mm. did you say to them that would best help me, or did they just they just knew that 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 would be the best support? I think those people just knew, and when I mm. thought about it afterwards, you know, you're always going to get that kind of support from another parent or maybe from another grandparent, you know, because they they get it, they've been there, but then. There were certain friends where I just felt I felt all right being with them and being with Callie and being with my emotions. And and afterwards, I realised a lot of them had been been through something big in their life. Mm -hmm. You know, they'd lost a sibling suddenly or, you know, something really tragic had happened to them. And it's I guess it's those people who who really understand that life isn't always fair and that really sad things can happen. And that's, you know. Yeah, no, no, you know, you, you can't you can't keep a baby alive just by loving them always, you know. But those people who've actually had that understanding, they're often the ones that are your, your kind of your best friends in those early days, particularly. Mm. Barbara, um, what uh, would uh, you say? Uh, yeah, go on. Um, I, I was thinking about what what you were saying, and it's something that. At, at cruise bereavement support we hear so many times um and it it resonates with what you've been saying Kelly um <laughs> <laughs> um it resonates in that um do you know when when the this which is the worst thing that's happened in my life i always thought that that person or that person would be there for me. And they just kind of drifted into the background. But um, there were a couple of people who I didn't even know that well have come into my life and been able to support me in a way that I wouldn't have expected. But I think the important thing is for us to know that the people that, that just aren't able to help at that time maybe it's because they just feel helpless and they're sometimes afraid of making things worse by mm -hmm. saying the wrong thing and um and so it's not that they're being unkind it's just that they they haven't got maybe the confidence to just stay with yeah the pain i really and agree what, yeah, and sometimes it's about whether it's the right time. So, you yes. know, I've I've recently had a conversation with my son that in the first year of Josh's life, you know, when he was he was in and out of hospital really poorly, you know, still got that, you know, only one in ten babies get to their first birthday hanging over their heads. I could see mentally he was struggling. Mm -hmm. But it was, it, it, you know, I'm a nurse by background, so I believe I have some skills, you, you know, to, to have difficult discussions. But even with my son, he wasn't ready for that conversation. Mm. And so, yeah. you know, the worry for me was, do I do I say to him, look, I, I can see you're depressed, Matthew, should we have a conversation about it? And, you know, and chose not to because, you know, for us, you know, that was that probably wasn't the right thing to do. But we've had Josh is five now. We've had a conversation, and Matthew says, I recognize it, but he couldn't have discussed it at that time. So sometimes it's yeah. about you you mentioned it, didn't you, Sonia? You know, when did you know support was was right? Yeah. Um, you know, and, and like I say, support changes, I think, and sometimes you just have to time your moments. Mm. And it might be that people can see it and A, A, they don't feel able to do it or B, they think maybe it's not the right time. Yeah. There are no right or wrong answers, are there? 
No, and I think different support is helpful for different types of people, especially men and women. Mm. Um, You know, that's probably another good point to raise. You know, what what kind of support did you find useful for yourself, but your partner might not have, or, you know, your son might not have, but you Mm. thought it could help them because it helped you, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't have made the difference Mm. at all because like you said the timing might not have been right or it's not that kind of support they need um for for example I I took counseling about a year later which helped me when people stopped talking about my son to me but I still needed that outlet so I found counseling very helpful a little bit later on where I just Mm -hmm. wanted a week an hour a week to myself just to say his name in a room and talk about everything I remember about about him and then just shut the door on it and carry on day to day life. But my husband just didn't feel like counselling did anything for him. He, you know, men tip like not talkers. Mm. He took that sort of approach, and he just wanted to like move on. And I think his support came from like doing things. So you know, better that he would do something for the charity or raise money mm. to actively do something like that to help his sort of process through it. Um, Jemima have you felt this difference between how you and your partner have taken support yeah I, I think so kind of similarly but I just feel as, as a generalization it is often women who are able to kind of network and we you know within a couple of months I had a, two or three really close contacts who've now who are still good friends who have had children mm. you know a couple of years older than Kelly you know it happened so quickly and so naturally for me and before long you know I had people who 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 could get it and mm-hmm. my partner's never really done that um I don't feel like that would have been the right thing for him he he needed he needed to you know he needs to go out and be by himself actually um yeah. you know so sometimes I used to go to to the hospice for the weekend with with Alba or in Cali or just with Cali before Alba was born and he would go out and spend the weekend by himself and that was that was what he needed but I think it's you know if it's if it's lonely being a mum I think it can be even more lonely (laughs) yeah you know I don't know I just think that a lot of women not all but you know a lot of women will just yeah I think make a lot sense, of it makes sense of things by by building a community around them and having mm. people to talk to and um I think where the dads always feel like they need to be the ones supporting the mums or take that role oh, on yes. instantaneously. It doesn't necessarily have to be that way. Like you no, know, I agree. Want to be there for them as well. And how do you sort of change that sort of narrative so that they can you know be as they want to be in that moment as well and ask Mm. for their support and help that they want to do as well and not feel like they shouldn't be able to do it very much so because um so often and and i know we've, we've mentioned this before so often it is one parent and usually the father that um feels that you know i have to be the strong one i have to you know keep this this family going i have to but who supports them, mm. and um, and it can be quite difficult for them to reach out and say, I, "I'm really struggling. I'm really struggling this week," or "I I just don't know." But interestingly, because um, I've been with with Cruise Bereavement Support for um, nearly thirty years, but I've actually had more male clients than female clients, which is interesting because there is that kind of, um, that kind of, well, women find it easier to to talk about their emotions. Maybe that is the case, but men still have to do if they, if they want to do, if Mm -hmm. they feel ready to, that has to be the right time for them Mm. um and you know and for a place that they can go and kind of maybe dump all of their stuff and then just close that door and then go on and get on with 
go on, get on with their life. They can leave all of that there. Yeah. I think um, my my husband went in, so, you know, we were all grieving. Everybody yeah. goes through the grieving yeah. process, don't they? But, but my husband was in the... Um, struggling to accept the diagnosis and dismissing what we'd been told and was very I think he felt that he was being supportive by being really positive you know that Josh wouldn't be as bad as everybody said he was going to be and and I I struggled with that because um you know, but I think that was the way he he dealt with it, and the support that he gave was by being positive. Mm. Um, you, you know, which was like I say, I was worried because I thought he's been overly optimistic, and this is a really bleak picture. So it's it's like we said, everybody responds differently, don't they? And gives yes, support yes. in 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 different ways, and certainly, you know, we all went into the doing. You know, at least practically, you feel as if you 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 know doing something to help. Yeah. Um, because you know, dealing with the emotions is really difficult. Yeah. As a supporter of, as someone who who supported someone in the process, who 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 did you go to? Who did you turn to to support you when you had difficult days about dealing with it with Josh and? So. I, uh, so I, I, I don't, well, I think, you know, when you were talking about support coming from places you didn't expect it, actually, so I've got two brothers and two sisters, and it was my brother who rang me up, who, who was just, I don't know, he was just amazing, and again, I did not expect that from my mm. brother, and it, I think he was the one where I could sh share my hopes and fears. But some nights, Sonia, I just sat at the kitchen table and wept. Everybody had gone to bed. Mm -hmm. And again, I think because I don't know, you know, whether it's, you know, you know, part of your, your nurse, and I don't know whether it's you are a parent, you have to be strong for your children, um mm. you know so so was feeling you know I can't show Matthew and Katie you know how upset I am because I need to be strong for them but I would say thinking about it because my husband was was oh it's going to be okay so I couldn't really speak to him about it because he didn't want to hear that you know yeah. so so I think you know mainly it was my brother which wasn't unexpected now now you've asked me that question Mm. You know, I hadn't really thought about it. You know, I got friends at work, you know, as well. But but in, in the main, it was my brother. Yeah, I think my mum did the same. She she lent on her brother, which was interesting. Mm. But it is, it comes unexpectedly, I think, as well. Like, mm. like you said, Jemima, like some people you thought mm. would be good with the situation was not. You never mm. knew you were going to be in the situation in yeah. the first place, so... How do you know how how people? But I agree. I think people that have been through a some kind of trauma seem mm. to gravitate more towards you about your mm. situation because they've definitely had some sort of part to play in that, and they know exactly what that means and mm. what you and probably it, it, it need is, at the time. It's sad how many friendships are impacted. You mm. know how people. Yes, people often come away very angry with friends or family and they're feeling let down yes you know yeah. and it's it's really sad you know it's something you see all the time but, and uh, I think I got to a point quite quickly that I just didn't want to be one of these people that were angry with people and I just mm. I just squared it by saying you know there's people that get it and there's people that don't and when I'm having a bad day I don't go anywhere near somebody that don't that doesn't mm. um you know we've all got friends that just say really insensitive things yes. um, and I'll just I'll just hang out with them or I'll reduce contact with them until I feel strong mm. um, and I'll just stick with the people that I feel good around and I'm, I'm not going to blame anyone because I don't know if I would have been a good support if this had happened to my sister or it happened mm. to my friend you know when I look back on friends that had 
babies a lot earlier than me I, I look back and think god I had no idea what they were managing you know and that's just a completely healthy baby you know so I mm. feel like I can't be cross with people because I don't think I would have been any better mm. yes it's a very healthy way to be isn't it yes yeah. absolutely absolutely yeah yeah. And I think what you said about, you know, the support from healthcare professionals, you know, uh, I know for Matthew and Katie, it was the paediatrician, you know, did, you know, like the GP, here's my number, anything you're worried about, you know, give me a ring. And if if you've got somebody like that, it, it is that that massive support, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and what wasn't supportive was the number of healthcare professionals that were coming, you, you know, the appointments. Mm. There was no joined up or coordination. Mm. And, yeah. you know, the, the OT, yeah. the physio, the yeah. health visitor, the social worker, all coming to the house asking the same questions. Yeah. And I know it was one of the things that, because um, Katie was on maternity leave, that stressed her out more than anything was the constant repeating of what was the matter with Josh because you're just reliving it all every mm -hmm. time you're having to repeat it to somebody yeah. and 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 it definitely wasn't wasn't supportive um what would have been more supportive is if there had been one key worker who would have coordinated everything that was incredibly stressful and you know Katie's written Joshua's story hasn't she for soft and that's one of the things that that she says you know then the no coordination the number of appointments mm -hmm. that you're expected to get to you know re really doesn't help especially you know that if you've got other children as well that you're trying to you know manage all that and sometimes mm -hmm. it's so hard to get these appointments that you just think I don't want to be stressed when I'm there and it's not so not so helpful as well I mean it's it's a very good point and I guess Jemima is you're still sort of doing it what what sort of support have you found has been good from a professional advisor you you mentioned when they listen and when they see you all as a holistic unit but was there anything specific in the support that they offered that you found that was actually quite useful or, or quite valuable well, I mean, I, I've always say to new parents that like part of the work is just building up those professionals that you really trust. Mm. And, and I do, I just feel those core skills of listening and giving time and looking holistically, that they're the things that kind of go the furthest. So, you know, we might see our respiratory consultant, but he'll, you know, he we, we might end up talking about something that's nothing to do with breathing or very little you know or you know mm -hmm. he always wants to know how we are as a family um I just I just feel really safe now with these um there's there's maybe four consultants and I've got their email addresses and I know so like when I got COVID and I, I was so so worried when I got COVID I was going to pass it on to Callie and I just I had four consultants that I could write to and I knew that one of them would get back to me probably within 24 mm. hours and they did and mm. you know that was you, you just feel safe when you know that you've got some people there that that, that can make things happen for you yeah. um, but, and, 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 uh, and understand and know the bigger picture because I was very struck with what uh, Debbie was saying almost like all of these individuals it, it sounds as though they hadn't even read through the notes before each consultation. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, yeah. Um, but a couple of the things that you have said, um, really inspirational consultants, GPs, that, you know, this is my number, you can call me anytime. Wow. There's something about yeah. trusting you. It's like they're yes. teaching us to fly. They know that whilst yes. we're learning to fly, we might need to contact them. But if they give us everything we need, then we'll be able to fly without them and we'll only occasionally have to come home to roost again, you know. And you, you, you're absolutely right, Jemima, because um, yeah. Matthew and Katie are both nurses and their frustration was the frequent admissions that Josh was having, which for them was the... 
that was the worst. When Josh was in hospital, it disrupts everything, you, you know. That there wasn't much sleep in the first year anyway. And they felt that if they were given tools at home, they could prevent some of the yeah. admissions. Yeah. Yeah. And so actually the paediatrician listening to them and they said, if we have this and the paediatrician trusting them. Yeah. And um, and absolutely, you know, the next time, you know, they they did what they needed to do, and Josh never had to go into hospital, and he hasn't been in hospital for quite a few years. And so again, building that trust up, mm. you know, with them, be, so that you can manage your child. Yeah. You know, because you become the expert, don't you? And I think the support is them mm. recognizing that you're the expert in your child's. Yeah. yeah, you know them best. And and it feels like uh, that trust is almost like a safety net because mm. you've got when you've got that safety net um underneath you, you often don't need to use it. It's knowing mm -hmm. that it's there. Yeah. So that that's what it that's what it sounds like from what you're saying, Debbie. Yeah. And, and I net. And I think, uh, I mean, obviously, you know, Jemima and I, our experiences with surviving children, but I guess, and, you know, Sonia, you would know this better, I guess that that support, you, you know, is as as crucial, you know, whether the child survives or, or not from the healthcare professionals yeah. and that they would trust you at whatever stage that you, you, your baby's at. Yeah, definitely. And I don't know if we've mentioned it already, but we've mentioned it in a previous conversation that we've had that as the support changes, it's just just as important to keep that support going for as long mm -hmm. as you need it. So from a bereaved perspective, that support obviously does change, but you don't necessarily know where it's going to come from mm -hmm. straight away. And and just as just as you just as you have Jemima built good relationships I built good relationships more more so after with some of the nurses that sort of got attached to my son and they just wanted to keep in touch with us and see how we get on and I sort of wanted to as well because you spend so much time with them and you know you know it could be little but a very intense period and it's the most important period of your life so anyone that you can connect yourself with you do and mm. if they're they're willing to stay in your life, then by all means they're welcome to, and you want to keep that mm. sort of relationship with them. And um, it is just a different. I think as a bereaved parent, you just you're living it every day, so it's a it's a it's a process every day. And and much like Jemima, like one day it'll be better, one day it won't, and mm. you lean on that different type of support as you need it and when you need it. Mm. And I, th I think the other thing that we haven't mentioned is is the support from the soft community, isn't there? Because certainly, yeah. you know, once we got Josh's diagnosis, you know, I went into research overload. And and then certainly, Jemima, I'd read your blogs about Cali, you know, because I was seeking to understand, you, you know, more. So that's the other support, isn't it? You know, of the of the parents who've been through it themselves and have got that lived experience and you know where you're grappling with with something you know so you know almost um certainly somebody else has done it and and so the Facebook groups and mm. yeah um, you know building that up. yeah yeah we, I'm glad you brought that up actually because where I found that I lacked support of it, during my time was not having enough families that I could relate to mm -hmm. and I at the time I didn't reach out enough um, probably but even after I wish I'd known there was such a community out there because that would have been the biggest support mm -hmm. that I personally would have loved to have and not feel so alone in what yeah. I was going through because you you meet parents you know but it's just not the same yeah and that's what I think um soft is just so good for especially but I think over COVID support changed big time so the the charity had to change the way that they supported families that way and I'm glad that a lot of those things have still stuck with 
um uh, with, with the charity as well so the zoom family zoom calls the podcasts mm-hmm. and you know you, you change with the times and it, they seem to be so popular and they're not going anywhere so mm-hmm. it's it's a good way of um reaching out to different types of um parents as well so not mm-hmm. every you're not doing a general call everyone can speak to someone who they can relate to instantly mm-hmm. about spe- and, and ask specific questions and not have to be mindful of you know other people's sort of situations at the same time but I guess also, that's that, sorry, no, go on Barbara no no you go no, I was just thinking because um you know that was one of the things um from lockdown I mean before lockdown I mean I don't know about yourselves but I didn't even really know about Zoom and mm. um the fact that you know we we have we have found that um you know that is a good way to connect but I'm just thinking with the the families because it might be more accessible for them to be able to um keep yeah. connected remotely than than maybe meeting up in face face to face because if they've got other children or other commitments they can um just you know allocate an hour here to um to keep connected and talking to people listening to people and knowing yes you get it you get it yeah. don't you you've, mm. you've been to a similar place yeah yeah but building up of relationships with other parents who are on a similar journey is yes. yeah it's so important that you know the, the yes. two women that I'm closest to you know I check in with them all the time and you know in fact one of them's just sent me a message tonight you know how are you doing and mm. <clears throat> and and you know she's she's been my mentor like I wouldn't have I wouldn't have I wouldn't have survived <laughs> without her and you know um and her her child passed away uh, last year oh. and she was even my mentor through that somehow I kind of traveled that road with her and I felt even then she was helping me along my pathway and there's there's nobody else on earth that could have done that for me and I hope that I was a good support for her as well and you know there's obviously there's a lot of sadness around uh you know having close friendships with other families but it they're the ones that get it more than anything and yes you know there's 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 nothing like it and you know you, you only need to have one other family that that you can connect with and you don't feel so alone and you've always got someone you can turn to absolutely and um i mean um Edwards and Patar syndrome are not that well known still in the wider society and uh you know, so you're able to be speaking to people who get it, who mm. understand, um, and that because when you were saying that, Jemima, it just felt like that the 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 two of you you were just there linked to each other, um, and were able to just be there for each other. You can't fix it, you can't make it better, mm. but you can yeah, be that, there. That was the thing. She, you know. We, in those few days when I just felt like I just felt like I knew exactly how she felt and and I think and I don't know if anyone else would have been able to give her that in the same way you know um yeah it's incredible really and it's part of the stuff that's wonderful about this life that we have with our children you know it's Mm. obviously so sad but it's also like that kind of connection is is part of what makes makes the whole thing such an incredible um I don't even know what the words are really but yeah it's so it's so enriching to be able to meet people and connect on that level Mm. Um, at a a deeply human level mm. not somebody not from here trying Mm. to fix it but just just from here yeah 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 but also when you as, as your child gets older if you do have a child that, that, that stays and you know you do stop when they start going to school and things and you you find that you 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 do meet other parents that way as well and and they will also you know if your child's at a school 
where there's other similar children and you do start making more connections with parents that are like you mm. which is also nice it's just making sure you build your community the way you want it, isn't it? And yeah. you let, let some into the inner circle, some you don't. But exactly. it's just nice to know that you're not the only one going through it and yeah. you've got other people to lean on professionally and, and personally, I think. Mm. Mm. I think that's uh I think that's a nice, nice ending to the really nice discussion. I had so many questions but we sort of answered them <laughs> as we were talking which is really really nice I just like sort of looked down and thought well I don't know what else we we can we could talk about mm. it a lot longer but I think we we touch on some really really good points and hopefully other families that listen to this will find it just as useful as I did so thank you all for for joining us and um yeah I hope um I hope you still stay in touch with soft mm. oh uh, and and thank you for for sharing your experiences um you know because like like you say Sonia this is so important for other for other parents for other maybe siblings to um to be able to yeah yeah it's not we're not on our own yeah so thank you thank you for inviting me thank you